Without a doubt, technology is redefining our daily lives, but there are some innovations that have changed the world forever. This week, conversations with innovators whose light bulb moments are history in the making. I'm Mike Walter in Los Angeles. Let's take it full frame. Think about this question carefully. What is the one object you use today that you wouldn't want to live without? If you're like most people, the answer is simple. It's this, your mobile phone. As Full Frame contributor Sandra Hughes reports, mobile phones have changed the way people live all around the world. While it's estimated more than 10,000 people have died in West Africa from the Ebola virus, doctors and healthcare workers from International Medical Corps are there saving lives every day. They work in some of the most remote areas of the world, and everyone at IMC knows the value of technology. For International Medical Corps, you know, communication is absolutely essential to be able to do our work. And we work in these very resource poor settings being able to relay um, really life and death information about um, whether it's a security incident or security situation for areas that are conflict zones, whether it's outbreak information about a disease that maybe we are seeing trends. 32 years ago, International Medical Corps started with a mission to train locally so that their work is multiplied. Now they use telemedicine in war zones, cell phone apps for dosage adjustments, and just about everything a cell phone is capable of is employed by their workers. It's much different than from the way they practice medicine and relief work three decades ago. You know, there it was more kind of hands-on, person-to-person kind of conversation and you would go through periods where there's no communication. I mean, we saw this after the Indian Ocean tsunami. Part of the reason the death toll was so high was that people couldn't get information that an earthquake was going to be triggering a large tsunami. You know, then we saw after the Japan earthquake and tsunami, we immediately knew that a tsunami was, there was a, a real danger. So um, to us, it allows us to save lives. Lisa Nestor worked for the United States Peace Corps and is finishing her MBA at the Anderson School of Management at the University of California, Los Angeles. She is working alongside UCLA faculty to create cell phone technology to facilitate an easier and more fair way for people to access and repay payday loans. Those are unsecured short-term loans that come with a hefty interest rate, but are often the only option for low-income individuals without access to any line of credit. You could make it a weekly automatic deduction that comes out of the account, um, or you could actually top up on when you make a uh, purchase you could top up that amount and have it directly go towards paying off your loan um, or putting it into a savings account. Nestor launched other ideas to help the working poor around the world using mobile technology and has found sometimes the razzle-dazzle of the idea may sparkle with opportunity but can fall flat. I spent five years abroad, um, specifically in development, and I think one of the biggest takeaways for me was that just because something's a good idea doesn't mean it's gonna work. Um, and a lot of times, half of the success is in figuring out who's gonna actually utilize the technology, who's gonna find the most value in it, and how are you gonna encourage adoption amongst people, right? Her program to offer farmers in India pricing information on their cell phones sounded like a great way to increase their price per yield, but it didn't work. But something that people don't think about is, you know, there's over 26 languages in India and there's a lot of illiterate farmers. So suddenly it's not just such a simple technology. You really have to think, all right, how is this person going to use this? 
From using satellite images of Earth to follow the spread of disease by tracking hospital parking lots, to using computer algorithms to predict unrest around the world, to the simple use of the cell phone for communication. Technology can and is being used and tested for good around the globe. So why here in the United States, one of the most developed countries in the world, do some people think they need a break from technology? I'm excited. No, definitely. Whatever you're part of, I know it's good. I must say I'm, I'm addicted to technology. 29-year-old Rose Ragazzi is like most young people. I wake up every single morning. The first thing I do is I grab my phone and I read the headlines. I want to know everything going on. And then I'll check my Facebook to see what's going on, my emails. And that's how I wake up in the mornings. Her fiance was worried about her addiction, and so was she. A coworker told her about a place to unplug, so she called a cousin and said, We're gonna go to Digital Detox. And what was it like? Life-changing. A weekend of adult camp with no technology was just the reminder she needed that mobile technology can't rule her life. Still, there are doubters. Digital detoxes don't work. What you really need to do is slowly wean yourself off of it. Dr. Larry Rosen has been teaching psychology at the University of California, Fullerton, for four decades. He worries that his students and the population in general are losing out while checking in. Students are always using the devices in class. They are always on some web page that has no relevance to the class at all. If they get a text, they immediately act like Pavlov's dogs and text back whether I'm saying something important or not, it doesn't seem to matter. Not only are students rude, but they seem to struggle to communicate in the old-fashioned way without emojis and texting slang. I think that part of what is happening with our world is we sadly are losing our ability to be face-to-face -face with someone. And part of it is because we've lost our ability to be able to tolerate eye contact. It's very interesting, if you watch people talk, They've stopped using eye contact. They will be checking their phone and then they'll look up in kind of a way to talk to someone because I think we've spent so much time with these little devices and communicating with the devices that we really don't know how to connect with someone on a nonverbal way. Since it came into use three decades ago, mobile technology has changed the way people do business and communicate on a daily basis. Its impact around the world, both positive and negative, has gone far beyond what anyone would have imagined. For Full Frame, this is Sandra Hughes in Los Angeles. There may be some debate on whether the overall impact of mobile phones on our daily lives has been positive or negative, but no one can deny, though, that the advent of cellular technology has changed our lives. In fact, mobile phones have changed the world forever. Remarkably, in 2014, the number of mobile subscriptions worldwide exceeded the human population at more than 7 billion. And we have our next guest to thank for all of that. Back in 1973, he was the Corporate Director of Research and Development at Motorola. That's when Martin Cooper led a team of engineers who were busy creating a truly portable telephone. On April 3, 1973, Martin Cooper made the first phone call using a truly portable device. The rest, as they say, is history. Martin Cooper joins us now to talk about all of that history and his thoughts on the role mobile phones play in our lives today. I want to welcome you to Full Frame. Thank you, Mike. And Good remarkably, Martin, you still use that phone today, don't you? <laughs> uh, just, no, but it's here. This is the baby, isn't it? That's one. This yeah. is 1973, probably before you were born, Mike. <laughs> You're too kind to me. Let me ask you this, because what I think a lot of our viewers may not know is this was sort of like the space race. You know, you got the Soviet Union and the U.S. trying to make it to the moon first. Motorola competing against AT&T. Obviously, you know, it's a race against the clock. Describe for us what it was like back then trying to create this. Well, keep in mind that AT&T was the biggest company in the world by every measure, people, revenues, profits, and we were just a little company in Chicago, and AT&T came up with this idea of cellular telephony. They were gonna set us free. We no longer had to use that wire that, that leased us to our homes and changed us to our desks, and their view of this freedom was that we were gonna be, have a car telephone. So we'd been trapped in our homes and in our desks for over 100 years, 
now we're going to be trapped in our cars. And we at <laughs> Motorola just did not believe that. We thought the time was ready for the real freedom that comes from being able to talk wherever you are at any time. And then the other thing that AT&T said was, well, we are a monopoly and car telephones are going to be a monopoly. Well, we didn't agree with that either. We wanted to stay in business. So uh, at that time, I decided we were going to have a dazzling demonstration that we were going to, the only way we could get the attention of the people that made the decisions in Washington was to show them a real cell phone and show, give them a vision of what the future was. And that's where I pulled together a bunch of really brilliant people and we created this. Amazing. This phone weighed two and a half pounds. And you can see how big it is. The yeah. battery life was 20 minutes of Jeez. talking. Wow. If that was not a problem because you couldn't hold this up for 20 <laughs> minutes. But it worked. We, it is half the size of Wyoming. Um, yeah. but, but your first phone call, which I, I think speaks volumes about the kind of guy you are because I think it's hysterical. Your first phone call, you could call your wife, you could call anybody, but who did you call? Well, it was serendipitous, but I thought I'd take a crack at calling our competitor, the guy that ran the AT&T program, a guy named Dr. Joel Engel, very smart guy. Uh, and I just took a wild chance talking to a reporter, not unlike you, and I called him and I said, I, I dialed his number and amazingly, he answered. Not a secretary, Joel. Wow. Joel, it's Marty. Hi, Marty. I'm talking to you from a cell phone but a real cell phone, a personal, handheld, portable cell phone. And there was silence at the other end of the line. You might guess that he was gnashing his teeth, <laughs> but uh, uh, Joel was polite to me, uh, as he uh, always is, uh, but he doesn't remember that phone call, and I guess I don't blame him. <laughs> but you remember, and the reporter remembers, uh, it must have been, I mean, the smile on your face making that call must have been pretty wide, I would think. It was good to rub it in. Yeah. One of the things I, I want to ask you is, have you been in a restaurant where somebody pulls out the cell phone and you sit there and you think, why did, why did I ever come up with this? Because it's become so ubiquitous. And in some ways, uh, some, some people are like, ah, oh, it's the worst thing in the world. I'm, it doesn't, I don't own it, it owns me. And then there are others who just can't live without it. I mean, there's a lot of different varied uh, viewpoints about it. And when you made that first phone call, I would think you're not thinking that far down the road. I mean, are you surprised at, at how it's kind of just infiltrated every aspect of our life? No, we're, I'm not at all surprised about that part of it, Mike. We knew then that once people got this phone in their hands that they would not be able to live without it because we had seen that in business. We had been making portable two-way radios and we found out, you go around the, an airport, for example, you see these people holding this thing in their hands. They don't ever put it in their pockets. So we knew that that was going to happen. We, we had a joke that said that someday when you were born, you would be assigned a phone number and if you didn't answer the phone, you had died. <laughs> <laughs> so we knew that was going to happen. But, you know, any technology that comes along is disruptive in one way or another. And the phone has been disruptive. And it took a while for people to get used to it. You know, it used to be you were in the movies and the phones would ring. That doesn't happen anymore. So people have learned how to accommodate it. There are still a few irritating things, like the restaurants. But if you think of the benefits, about how your life has improved because you've got that cell phone, it's worth all the little annoyances. One of my colleagues said, oh my God, you're interviewing him? He's a modern day Thomas Edison. Is that how you see yourself? No, I'm just a, just a regular engineer that saw a problem and came up with a solution. But you must think differently than the rest of us because I think a lot of people back then probably weren't thinking we need a cell phone. I mean, uh, you spot <clears throat> things that others, when we look at the landscape, we may not see what you see. Well, there are, uh, there are, if you want to do a psychoanalysis now, <laughs> we, we could do that, Mike. Yeah, but it has to do with, first of all, uh, having a vivid imagination. Uh, and I have been doing that since I was a little kid. I grew up with mythology and science fiction, and, and I've always lived in a dream world of, of my own. Uh, but I also always knew I was going to be an engineer. And I was lucky enough to go to a great high school, to a university uh, that is highly respected, Illinois Institute of Technology. 
Uh, and so I had the tools so I could execute the things that popped up in my mind. It's so funny talking to you. you. Your eyes light up. It wasn't a profession. It was a passion, wasn't it? Of course. Yeah. I think that anybody that doesn't do a work in which they can be passionate, because I hate to say this, Mike, but your eyes also light up when you talk about what you're doing. Uh, I think it's a shame. Everybody ought to be able to do things they have a passion for. Let me ask you uh, this question, because I think it, it kind of gets to the heart of, of, of what this has done. Uh, my daughter is in Guyana in this very small village, Sand Creek, and we were down there for her birthday. And uh, there's no electricity. They had, to, they had to, you know, bring in a generator to put together the electricity to play the music and have some lights for her party or birthday party. And yet there were little kids taking pictures with cell phones. Um, it is spread everywhere. And, uh, you know, I talked about perhaps the annoyance of somebody sitting at the table next to you on the phone, but what it's done in terms of eradicating poverty in some, some, some respects, uh, some of the tentacles, uh, clearly, I, I, you had to know that it was going to go and was going to be huge, but are you surprised at, at some of the, the technology that's come as a result of it? Well, first of all, we could never have predicted that all of these things that you talked about could be squeezed into one phone. I mean, this, this phone has got thousands of parts in it. It was an, an, a marvelous engineering achievement to put everything in there. Uh, but uh, the term we use is the number of transistors. Now, there may have been a few thousand transistors. That phone that you have in your hand has two billion transistors. Five years ago, that would have been a supercomputer. We could never have predicted that in 1973. There were no digital cameras. The internet hadn't been created or the World Wide Web. Uh, the integrated circuit hadn't happened yet. So uh, we could not have predicted all of those. Yeah, and in fact, that's another, uh, you know, we were talking about the paging system. I mean, you, <laughs> through creating this, you've also killed the, the uh, camera. I mean, so many people take the pictures now with, with their cell phones. But march us along, take us on the march, because I know you brought <coughs> some other devices along. Uh, show us what you have here and kind of talk to us a little bit about some of the older uh, phones that you brought along. Oh, and these are still pretty heavy too. Well, they are. Uh, this phone was totally impractical. We had to have an engineer along with us to keep it running all the time just because it, we squeezed so much in there. Uh, but by 1983, we had gone through a number of iterations in the laboratory and finally came up with something that we could actually produce in quantity, and that was this phone. Wow. This is the very first uh, commercial cell phone. Uh, in uh, December of 1983. This phone sold for $4,000. Wow. Which today would be about twice that. And, and yet we sold lots of them, didn't work very well, but the people that needed them really did need uh, to have this freedom, uh, and it was a bargain for them. And it didn't take long. Within a few years, we had cut the size of the phone by two and the weight. And of course, about seven years later, we came up with a flip phone. Uh, and uh, today, the, uh, it, uh, we've decided that phones may not be uh, as small as they should be. Maybe we ought to make them bigger. I think this phone that you have in your hand is suboptimal in every respect. If, if you try to build something that does all things for all people, they won't do any of them in the best possible way. And so, so the smartphone's not so smart. It, well, it's very smart, but it also it takes an engineer to run. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, good technology ought to be intuitive uh, and invisible. You shouldn't even know that it's there. And yet, when we buy a cell phone, we have to learn all kinds of new things. That's bad technology. So what I see in the future is, first of all, the phone's going to be more customized. The phone is going to ask you a few questions and it's going to design itself to your personality. And the second thing is, what's this business of holding a phone up to your ear? Have you held a long conversation? And it, I mean, it's, first of all, it hurts your, the side of your face. I mean, it, it's not a good phone. And what is an ideal phone? Well, I don't want to invent on your program, <laughs> but it really ought, go to right be, it ought to be stuck behind your ear, maybe even under your skin. It ought to contain a computer that can listen to you so I can say, get Mike on the phone. 
Well, which Mike? You want uh, Mike, uh, your son-in-law, or Mike, the newscaster in L.A.? And I'll say the newscaster, and the next thing you know, I'm talking to you, and I'm sitting there uh, without having learned anything. That's an ideal phone. But the other things the phone will do, uh, you will have devices on your body, some implanted, that will be measuring your body so that you can have a physical examination not every year or every five years, but every minute. And doing that, we will be able to anticipate when you're going to get sick before you get sick and solve your problems. We're going to revolutionize medicine. We are going to have these kids playing games today. Those games are going to turn into educational systems. Our children are going to be smarter and much better educated. But most importantly, people are learning how to collaborate, not just when they sit in a meeting, but when they can, you know, wherever they are, at any time, all over the world, they can talk to each other and create. And that is going to improve our productivity so much that we will, in fact, eradicate poverty. It's going to take a generation or two but that is going to happen, Mike. So tell me about some of the stuff that you're, you're doing now. I mean, you, you, obviously you're thinking, but in terms of, uh, you know, I mean, you're not slowing down. Uh, a lot of folks might be kind of, you're down near the beach in San Diego. They might be hanging out at the beach all the time. But I can tell that this thing never stops going. Well, I'm very lucky. I got some very good genes. Yeah. So I do have the, uh, the energy and the uh, ability to keep going. I'm st working on what these future things are going to happen because they're not going to happen if you have a bill of $100 a month for your cell phone. We've got to get the cost of the service way down. And in order to do that, we have to be able to use the radio channels much more efficiently than we do today. So I sit on a couple of government committees where I'm trying to promote this idea of let's get more efficient so that everybody in the world can benefit from this new technology. Uh, just those of us uh, in the United States who are lucky enough to be rich enough to have a smartphone. Everybody in the world, just like there are 7 billion phones in the world today, at some point there have got to be 7 billion smartphones, and those smartphones are going to be distributed, so you're going to have all kinds of devices that you carry with you, with you. And remember what I said, each one customized to you. You will be a real person and not just a statistic uh, like, the, uh, like you are perceived by the guys that made that phone. Martin Cooper, what a delight. Thanks so much for coming in. My and thanks pleasure, for this. <laughs> we'll be back with more technology that has changed the world forever in just a moment.